be fine. Cool. So thank you everyone for um, coming to my talk today for, and thanks to Sam for inviting me along. I'm going to be talking today um, about uh, Dungeons and Dragons and as the title says there, how Dungeons and Dragons learn to love the Gothic. Um, in the session this morning, I kind of got to the hour. Um, I'm going to try and cut a few bits so we've got a bit more time for questions. But if you do need to leave and it's getting a bit tight for you, then that's fine. Um, but if you want to hang around to have a bit of a chat afterwards, equally that would be really good. Um, my um, Twitter handle's at the bottom with the hashtag. I'll put some of that stuff in the chat at the end um, after the session. But one thing I want to do first of all is part of the etiquette of kind of modern D&D um, &D, and really going back quite a while for people who've, who've been running Dungeons and Dragons sessions is that before we actually play the game, we have what we call a session zero. And session zero is a kind of out of game um, discussion with everybody who's going to participate um, about who they are, what they want to put into the game, um, how much they want to do, and more importantly than that, what they want to get out of the game, the, uh, the aims that they have and what they want to do. If they just want to enjoy it, if they want to try and explore some things, and we can work to that. So I'm going to start off with um, a session zero. Um, and then I'm going to move to a case study about how Gothic has amended D&D and how what it kind of does to mess it up. And then we'll go into some stuff at the end if we have a bit of time, a few extra um, bits and pieces. So first of all, who am I? Um, why are you listening to me talking about this stuff? Well, my name is Dan Peterson. Um, and as Sam uh, explained, I am um, an independent scholar and I bear, I'm based in Edinburgh here in Scotland. Um, I've kind of mentioned on the call this morning, I think independent scholars may be a bit grand for what I do. I'm very pleased to be called an independent scholar, um, but I'm effectively, I just sort of sit around and have a think about stuff. And if I can get stuff that I find interesting into those thoughts, then all the better. But what I am is a long-term uh, role player, gamer, um, Dungeons and Dragons player and, du and Dungeon Master. Um, I even remember the first time I played um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons many years ago, uh, was at primary school, which for me is many decades ago now, which is quite frightening. And what I'm interested in is how we can use play and the ideas of playing to help us look at the world, look at what we might consider the real world, which is sometimes thought of as different as play, um, and how we can use that and how what we do when we're playing to change the world, to make changes either to ourselves or to the world itself. Um, I've got there my an extract from the character sheets for the character that I'm playing at the moment in a Dungeons and Dragons game. I kind of drop in now and again when somebody else is, is running the game. Um, and I'm hoping that they're gonna help me because as you can see there, I've circled the, their uh, persuasion and performance roles have a mighty plus six. Um, so if anything uh, doesn't seem right or you're not enjoying this, it's their fault, not mine. Oh, wrong way. But I know um, that many people on the call um, will possibly have played uh, role-playing games, if not Dungeons and Dragons specifically. Um, but equally, I don't want to assume that everybody has. So I'm going to go through a quick uh, run through of what D&D &D actually is um, and what it's for, what we want to do when we play Dungeons and Dragons. So D&D was first released in 1974. Um, it was created by two friends, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, two Americans. And it was released initially as a box set game that they built themselves. They printed everything and they made even the box. Um, and they also provided dice for you to play the game with. The core of that um, game was three books. And the first one, a sort of pamphlet, um, is there, volume one, Men and Magic. And that tells you how to um, develop your character. And that's kind of carried through um, in all of the editions of Dungeons & Dragons, three main books um, that you use to run the game with. Some of the um, histories of D&D, certainly some of the shorter ones, kind of make out that Dungeons & Dragons just appeared, largely in Gary Gygax's brain, um, helped by his friend. Um, but that's not strictly true. Um, what Dungeons & Dragons came from was a previous game called Chainmail. And Chainmail was a pure miniatures wargaming rule set, based on a table playing, um, uh, playing out a war. Gygax, added fantasy elements to Chainmail to make it more what he wanted to see based on um, books and films that he'd been enjoying. And even that goes back a bit further. We have, um, what I said there is the Prussian army's Kriegspiel, literally war game, and also um, the Little Wars games from 
an author you've probably heard of, H.G. Wells. Now, what these did that was interesting, um, especially Kriegspiel, and that was um, back in the early part of the 1800s. Um, and there's a nice quote there from General Feldmarschall von Muffling, which is one of the best names I've seen uh, researching this, is that Kriegspiel was no ordinary sort of game. This is schooling for war. And Kriegspiel was um, specifically developed so that we could, you could train Prussian army officers in grand war, total war, they would become known as, um, rather than small um, troop-based tactical warfare. And the unique thing about this was rather than two people facing each other, playing out rules, moving wooden blocks to represent their men and material, was that Kriegspiel introduced an umpire or a referee. The two players of Kriegspiel would write down their rules um, and normally a few steps ahead and they would pass them to the umpire and who then would arbitrate the result of those rules. They would um, think about the environment that they were playing in, the weather, the morale of uh, the armies and how that would play out. So in many ways that kind of introduced the idea rather than a game where you play against players, a game that you play that's arbitrated through an umpire. We call that the dungeon master. So that's kind of a, a bit of a background going into it and Dungeons and Dragons itself is now in its fifth edition. Um, that's the new player handbook, the main core rule book that we used and we kind of shorthand that as um, 5e, um, which I might refer to later on. And that was released in 2014, so it's a few years old now. Um, whether we'll see a new version soon is, is, um, uh, is hard to guess. Uh, five edition seems to be uh, pretty well received. That's a history of Dungeons and Dragons, where it came from. It's not really what Dungeons and Dragons is. So to explain it a bit more, I've got a few ideas of what um, what D and D is. And Dungeons and Dragons is a role playing game, and that um, predictably is a game in which the participants all play a role. The main role, um, which most of the people who are playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons will take on, is that of the player. Players operate and become player characters and they are kind of the heroes to use the kind of loose word of the story the protagonists is probably a better way of doing it because they're not always heroic um, those player characters take on archetypes the fighter the mage or magic user because there are different kinds of magic in dungeons and dragons the thief and various more esoteric ones and we've got there the classic example of the dungeons and dragons um, animated series um, which i used to watch obsessively as a kid um, and you can see there are a number of the archetypes that are being played out. You've got the ranger, you've got the magic user in the background, you've got uh, a surprisingly small barbarian, but well, a fierce one nonetheless. So they play the game, but we need someone in the sense of the Kriegspieler to arbitrate the game, to be the umpire. And for that, we have Dungeon Master. Dungeon Master is a role I normally play, although I do like to um, play the game as a player character when I can. And the thing to remember about the Dungeon Master is that the Dungeon Master does everything else, everything that the player characters can't, uh, that don't do. They play out the non-player characters, we call them. So they are individuals who live in the world. You might have an innkeeper, you might have an evil wizard, you might have various other um, characters that your PCs interact with. But they also run the world. And they run the rules that run the world behind them. Everything that develops and creates the world. So we have this kind of interaction. The dungeon master describes a scene. You enter a dungeon, you enter a forest, you are exploring some castle, maybe even in the clouds. And the player characters then respond to that. They say that what they want to do, the dungeon master responds to that, responds to that, responds to that, and you build up um, the game. I thought it's worth as well going through a few minor bits of terminology that I might use in the thing. Nothing too esoteric in this, but a way of explaining um, how we sort of build a Dungeons and Dragons game. This here um, on the right hand side is the front of the Lost Mine of Fandelver adventure, which is the adventure you get if you buy the starter set for 5e. It's the basic entry level um, adventure and it's one that we're, my group, are playing through at the moment. So you have a party is a key element of Dungeons and Dragons, and that is the group of player characters who are playing through the adventure. Hopefully they're playing together and working together, 
doesn't always happen um, and it's interesting when it doesn't and you can see here a party you've got a dwarven fighter at the front you've got a wizard with her staff you've got a number of other characters and they're fighting a dragon in a dungeon which is almost a very weird thing to see in dungeons and dragons the party play through a campaign the campaign is the overarching sort of narrative arc of a Dungeons and Dragons game. Lost Mine of Fandelver is in itself a campaign that runs, and that can last for months or even years. We've been playing Lost Mine of Fandelver now, and I've kind of um, added a few things, um, developed a few extra bits. The players have thrown me at some points. We've been playing it for certainly over a year. Um, if you consider some of the gaps that we've had when people have been away, um, and now that we've got the issues with the pandemic, which make it a bit more difficult, it's probably near two years now that we've been playing this. Some people have rattled through this in a month or two months. Um, if you play very often um, or if you don't develop the story yourself, making things up, you can play through this quite quickly. A campaign is made up of scenarios and they're effectively chapters in the campaign. If you think of the campaign as a long novel, um, the scenarios are certain chapters. Here we have a number of scenarios. The start off is the party being ambushed um, by a party of goblins. They then move into Fandlin, which is the town in the local area. And then they develop on into effectively um, the end game and some other little side quests that they can go on. We have a session. And a session is the actual real world period of playing Dungeons and Dragons. We got their particularly unpleasant looking dungeon, uh, dungeon master. He doesn't look like he'd give them much um, to go with, but that can be played um, over a, a number of hours. Some people it's as little as two hours, some people even take a whole day and effectively play all through the day taking breaks um, for food, hopefully. We play normally for about three or four hours. Uh, we're all old people now who have jobs and some of us children, um, so we, uh, we keep it to a shortish period of time. But that lets us play through a scenario normally um, and maybe have a chat about how things we want to do. You can see there a few of the sort of bits of the kit of the uh, of D and D, we've got a playing area um, which we can use miniatures and some, um, scenery in to explain what is happening in the world um, as a an addition to describing it. We've got the dungeon master screen where all of the strange arcane um, materials of the dungeon master, like pens and pencils, are kept hidden. And we also have um, in the, the tub there the dice. So I think it's probably when people think of D&D, &D, probably think of role playing, dice is probably going to be quite high up in your thoughts. And we have a set of um, traditional set of polyhedral dice. They move from the four sided um, pyramidal dice, which weirdly my wife is frightened of. She refuses to accept that they exist. And that goes up to normally the 20 sided dice or the D20, which is the core, um, I would say, dice for Dungeons and Dragons. You can go higher. You can go to ridiculous things like a D100, which as it says is a dice with a hundred size, uh, size. That takes about three days to stop rolling because it does keep going on like a ball. So they're more, um, more amusements than anything else. But the key dice I think there um, are things that you need to keep in mind as the tools of um, a role-playing game. And I want to talk as well about what the Gothic is, or at least what the Gothic is to so this hour, this session that I'm going to run through, we've had over the past uh, few months, I think it is now, um, a lot of excellent descriptions of the Gothic, much better than I will um, ever be able to do, um, and much, I think, more learned, if you want to say. Um, but what I want to talk about at the moment is the Gothic in the way that it transgresses and in the way that it breaks rules. It allows us to consider the things that they are and how they might be if they weren't how they are. And they want to do that in the way of categories, so how things are grouped together, and especially how they are kept separate from other groups of things. Limits, the edges of those categories, and how porous they might be, or how porous we might not want them to be, in a way that kind of talks to um, ideas of um, um, abjection, in the way that Julia Presteva talks about it. Can things cross from one category over a limit into another? Do we like it when that happens? And one thing I'll talk about um, in a bit more depth is the idea of anxieties, how the Gothic talks about and allows us to investigate the anxieties that we may have about ourselves, our place in the world and the world as a thing. I've put there that I'm less concerned about the aesthetic elements of the Gothic. They are a, a, a big part of the Gothic and they are a big part of Dungeons and Dragons. Someone mentioned, um, I thought a very insightful comment this morning, the idea of the dungeon 
um, in itself as a gothic element. And another word for a dungeon or a tomb is a crypt. And crypt means something that is hidden and kept separate. And I think that's quite, um, quite an interesting thing. I wish I'd thought of myself. However, as you can see from the picture that I've used there, this is a small piece of foreshadowing. So there might be something coming up related to the aesthetic later on. Let's see. But in the last kind of section of this session zero, exploring why I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons, why am I talking about Dungeons and Dragons? Every time you mention Dungeons and Dragons as a role playing game, somebody somewhere will roll their eyes, sigh, and say, oh, oh Dungeons and Dragons is so boring. It is, in a way, boring because it's so popular and it's so prevalent. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is what a lot of people talk about, but as it says there, other RPGs are available. There are ones from other large publishers, um, and there are ones from very small niche publishers that you may download as a PDF, you may get as a simple Xerox pamphlet. And what I want to do is just have a quick run through three different um, RPG rule sets, um, explain a bit about what they are and how they use the Gothic and explain why it is that I'm not using them. The first one is Death on the Reich, which was released in 1987. Death on the Reich is a campaign for the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay setting and rule set. Um, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay is sometimes referred to as Ruff Ruff Ruff, or at least it was when I was a kid, when I was playing through this, um, and it became one of my favourite uh, campaigns. I love the idea of the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay setting, and I specifically love this, this campaign. And I love it because it is set in this horrendously horrible quasi-medieval old world setting. Um, this is hugely gothic in many ways. Uh, it's decadent, it's corrupt, everything is rotting, everything is falling down and collapsing from the buildings to the people themselves. Everything um, that's pleasant and nice that we would think of in our world corrupts people in the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay setting. Magic, which is normally thought of as some kind of powerful thing, inevitably corrupts the users. Power in itself corrupts people. Money, even pleasure itself corrupts people. Either you'll get um, uh, hunted down by witchfinders for being too happy, or you will fall to chaos and uh, to, um, to death, ultimately. But Death on the Reich um, is not just set in the old world, wandering around this medieval analogue of um, Western Europe. Um, it ends, and it is largely set, in Castle Wittgenstein. And Castle Wittgenstein is a sprawling Gorman Gastian um, citadel uh, that the most part of the end of the game is set in. Castle Wittgenstein, and I, I, I went on to do a philosophy degree, and I'm sure that this some, um, had something to do with it, um, because Castle Wittgenstein is uh, inhabited by lots of strange uh, characters, one of which is a rather genial old uncle uh, called Gregor, and he is slowly turning into a beetle. And again, I think that's probably been taken from another story, as has Lady Magritte, who is the antagonist of the entire story. She's a necromancer, the eldest daughter of um, the Wittgenstein family. She has fallen into evil magic, and she has started uh, attempting to use her life itself by creating an undead monster from fragments of bodies that she has had her servants steal from local graveyards. And Death on the Reek ends in the tower, the main tower of Castle Wittgenstein, in the middle of a thunderstorm as Lady Magritte's plans come to fruition. And it just so happens, as it often just so happens, that a lightning bolt strikes the tower and animates the monster precisely as the party arrive. And they have to defeat that and defeat Magritte in order to survive, let alone win the campaign. The next one I'm going to talk about is Vampire the Masquerade, uh, which was released in 91, um, and it is really 90s. Even now, with the newer editions, it's still pretty 90s. Um, Vampire the Masquerade is um, a contemporary setting. Um, it tends to be set in LA. It doesn't have to be, but that kind of urban, um, nocturnal setting. And it's described on the jacket of the book as gothic punk. And there is a lot of this where characters will be playing vampires, but they're cool vampires. They're goth vampires. They go to clubs. They, go, um, they, they drive around in, um, in blacked out cars. But the aim of Vampire the Masquerade is to explore ideas of humanity and inhumanity. What it means to be human, what it means not to be human, the concept of horror as a whole, and how we can have salvation from horror 
or from in humanity, even how we can save ourselves from our humanity, which is quite an interesting thing to think about. There's a lot of this um, where the ideas of um, vampiric humanity in itself, the whole idea that vampires can lose their humanity, become monsters um, and reveal themselves through this monstrosity to the, the normal world, to humans. Um, is a big part of Vampire the Masquerade. And that itself, this kind of um, underlayer of reality, I think is a very gothic element. And the final one I want to talk about is a modern one, Alien from last year, um, the Free League's new uh, role-playing game around Alien. An Alien, you might think, is a sci-fi story. It's a sci-fi film and various comics and various things. So what's it doing in this gothic um, talk? Well, I think that it is sci-fi, but Alien is a vampire movie. <clears throat> Aliens are vampires. I'm getting, I'm getting emotional now. <clears throat> the alien in Alien the film lives in a remote abandoned castle, which a party of travelers happen to stumble across. It infects them with its own genetic material and uses them to make more of its kind. It's an abject creature that breaks alien human boundaries and limits. And it is itself a hugely gothic element, I think, a, a thing that appears sort of humanoid, but isn't and is a dreadful threat to actual humans. But equally in Alien, we also have this gothic doubling of androids, synthetics, artificial people, whatever um, they want to be referred to as, mannequins that look human and in many respects are human they act like humans they have thoughts and concerns like humans but they aren't human and we also have the corporations and they have a kind of doubling effect of human relationships but they also to me they make make me think of um, the ideas in dracula where dracula himself has this plan to take over western civilization and run it for himself and i think you you can see that in entities like Wayland yutani and some of the other corporations that uh, appear in the wider canon of Alien. And you also, very critically, I think, have these sublime, terrifying environments. You have spaceships, the vast and almost beyond um, sort of human understanding, traveling at massive speeds. You have planets that are completely different from the ones that we um, experience. And then, more so, you have the gulf between planets, between stars, and even between systems. And I think that when we think of um, Gothic texts that talk about nighttime and darkness and vastness, that appears very strongly in Alien and especially in the Alien RPG. So I think all of these, as I say there, they're more inherently Gothic than Dungeons and Dragons. They have Gothic baked into them. And when you approach these role-playing games, you think this is probably, maybe not even consciously, but you think this is going to have at least some horror elements, some gothic elements, something that is going to be a bit different from what I'm used to. And that is why I'm not using them in order to talk about how the gothic can change things. Because D&D isn't gothic. D&D isn't really anything. D&D is a setting, and a, 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 sorry, a rule set that allows you to play games in various settings. Nothing is baked in apart potentially from a fantasy element. But even that can be removed where um, magic um, can be turned into laser guns if you want to. Psionic abilities, it can be different kinds of things. So we've got this kind of clash um, between Dungeons and Dragons being this hugely popular game and pastime. Um, it has had since fifth edition has been released year on year best sales. It keeps ticking up in sales year on year, huge amounts of people playing the game. I saw um, earlier on that there was something like 4 billion minutes of live role playing D and D has been watched how that accurate that is. I don't know, but it's a lot. Um, D and D also uses well-known tropes. It's quite a comfortable game to play largely. If you've read the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, you know, about the environment, certainly of many of the settings. If you've listened to um, various uh, stories, you won't find D&D that weird. Um, the idea of a party, a mismatched party of adventurers going out into the world, questing, having adventures, um, it's fairly standard in many ways. And as I kind of mentioned before, Dungeons and Dragons can be considered not that proper. 
by experts. And I put that in inverted commas because whether anyone is an expert about these kind of things, I don't know. But it's kind of, it is looked down a bit on. And that's not a bad thing because Dungeons and Dragons, it's not the best role playing game. Um, it does have its own issues, some of which we might go on to later on. Um, but it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. But one thing I've also liked to talk about is the flip side of that. And this subtitle there, Beggarly Daydreaming, um, is a quote from Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who um, that's how he referred to um, uh, Gothic texts in one of his um, tirades against Gothic uh, fiction. And I think that's kind of how a lot of people think of um, D&D. It's kind of seen as a niche hobby. Um, outcasts is maybe a little strong, but I think certainly many people would think it's someone who, you know, a group of friends um, sit together, they're probably the only friends that they have. You see that in things even like um, Stranger Things, where it's the group of, um, so let's say, unusual children are the ones who are playing D&D, not the cool kids, um, not the, uh, not the um, achievers. We also have arcane and occult terminology. We have a lot of things in the rules. We used to have a thing called FACO, um, which is just madness. Um, we now use things like car and whiz and various shortenings for the abilities that we have. Um, we talk about magical things in very, what could be considered occult, at least hidden and not understood by outsiders terminology. But one of the main things that I'm interested in is how Dungeons and Dragons lets people explore their personalities. It lets people think about who they are, who they might be, if they could change things, if they had different abilities. And there are concerns, as you can see on the right hand side, that it, it forcibly changes people's personalities. Those series of images are extracts from what's called a chick tract. Um, and they are a series of um, pamphlets, effectively, often in this kind of photo story style, um, that were developed by an evangelist in America called Jack Chick. Um, this one goes through how, as a, um, a, a definite end of Dungeons and Dragons, you will be inculcated into black magic and a witch's coven, which sadly has never happened to me. It would be quite cool if it did, but it never has. Nor have I ever learned how to use real spells in the real world, which seems to be implied in that middle uh, paragraph. There are a number of these. This one's called Dark Dungeons, and it's from 1984. And Jack Chick effectively made one of these pamphlets for everything he didn't like, which is pretty much everything. There was a huge um, archive of them, and you can find them on the web. Um, and they are quite interesting when you think about how people look at things that they don't really know a lot about, and have probably never experienced. They are interesting to look through. And I think it's that idea that Dungeons and Dragons is something that's inconsequential. It's a childish game. It's a waste of time. And yet it's also exceptionally dangerous, can change people's personality, and in some cases can lead to them dying. Um, there is in the, um, the, the early to early 80s to early 90s, probably, um, if you talk about the largest um, time of it, a period called the Satanic Panic. And that was um, a big moral outrage over things like Dungeons and Dragons, but also heavy metal, drugs, um, video nasties, all these things that would corrupt children and um, take them away from the normally the correct path, normally the Christian path. And there's that kind of, um, again, tension between something that's useless and something that has this intensely dangerous power over people. And there's a quote there from a review that I'd like to read through. I think it's quite a nice quote. It, it's quite a good review um, in, in the sense that it's a bad review. Um, but uh, I think it gives some sense of what people think about these things. So, we need scarcely say that these volumes have neither principle, object, nor moral. The horror which abounds in them is too grotesque and bizarre ever to approach near the sublime. And when we did not hurry over the pages in disgust, we sometimes pause to laugh outright. And yet we suspect that the diseased and wandering imagination which has stepped out of all legitimate bounds to frame these disjointed combinations and unnatural adventures might be disciplined into something better. So this review says that the books that we're looking at are immoral. They have no content within them and they are grotesque and bizarre. The people who wrote these books are diseased. It implies that they have some kind of mental illness. And 
that what it does is it presents unnatural adventures. But even so, they must have the ability that if they were perhaps disciplined um, and led by proper people, they could do something worthwhile. And this, when we talk about this, could well be a review of the three main core rule books for Dungeons and Dragons, but it is not. It's a review from 1818 of Frankenstein. The establishment, reviewers and critics, people in power, people who were proper, thought that the Gothic was useless and a waste of time, but also exceptionally dangerous. The same opinion of the Gothic and of Dungeons and Dragons. And I would say that there's probably the same opinion of most popular, um, popular entertainment to a large degree. So we have this conflict then. We have the categories that I mentioned before. Dungeons and Dragons has these set categories. It has a race, like an elf or a dwarf. You have your class, a fighter, a magic user, and you have the abilities that are developed from them. But you can easily override those. Just because you're a dwarf doesn't mean that you have to be this stoic, grumpy fighter. Just because you're an elf doesn't mean that you have to be a graceful ranger or a magic user. You can do what you want to be. The limits of the rule sets, and Dungeons and Dragons does have a lot of rules. It doesn't have the most rules out of any game, but there are, as I've said, three books, um, which you can, um, core books, which you can go through to the rules, and there are extra additional ones. But equally, you can ignore the rules. If one of my players wants to do something that I thought was really cool or funny or seemed to progress the narrative in some way, I would let them have a go even if it defied the rules. And we have these anxieties, which I've mentioned in the previous few slides. And there's a quote here from the book, A Christian Response to Dungeons and Dragons. That was written in 1987, so slightly later than The Chick Tract um, by Peter Lightheart and George Grant. To call it a book is probably to uh, bulk it up a bit. I think it's about 12, 13 pages long. It's kind of a small pamphlet. But they say, one of the chief defenses of role-playing games is that they stimulate the imagination. This is undeniably true. The question is whether we want our imagination or that of our children stimulated in this particular way. And the thrust of Lightheart and Grant's argument is Dungeons and Dragons is bad because it makes people think. It makes people think about rules. It makes people think about what they can do if those rules didn't apply anymore. And they find this, as you work through the book, very dangerous. And I think for people who believe in rules, and people who believe who want children to follow rules and grow up with the same rules, it is dangerous. Um, it's as dangerous as we can see up there, a skeleton jumping out of a water-filled dungeon. So this is the kind of L, um, end of this first section, uh, which is taking me half the time to go through as it did before. Um, so I've said before that Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game, and that is true, but Dungeons and Dragons is really a storytelling game. You play these roles in order to tell a story and the player characters and the dungeon master work together to create a narrative. And all narratives need their different settings. One well, of the main settings, not the first setting, but certainly one of the largest ones and one that's well played, it's where I play my games, is the Forgotten Realms. And if you've played Baldur's Gate, the video series of Baldur's Gate or Neverwinter Nights, that is set in the Forgotten Realms. It's a very standard fantasy Kind of setting there is magic and there is peril if you've ever watched uh, critical role um, the web series that is live uh, playing of dungeons and dragons their setting is exandria and they play um, on the continent of wild mount and there's the relatively new source book for uh, that setting and if you're not that keen on magic um, or you want something that's a bit darker for Dungeons and Dragons, there's the Dark Sun setting. That's a post-apocalyptic um, setting where magic does exist, but in the same way as a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, it's a corrupting force and it is a dark force um, that is, is uh, not easily dabbled with. But as a case study, I'm going to look at one of my other favourite settings, which is the very gothic setting of Ravenloft. And Ravenloft is uh, a section, my lightning came in a bit late there. Um, Ravenloft is a very gothic setting. It's very atmospheric. Um, it takes all of the gothic um, uh, elements from kind of core classic texts through to hammer horror, through to anything that you can want to do. It can be camp, it can be very, very dark um, and grim. And the adventure um, of Ravenloft starts 
like this. The woods are quiet this night, and the air grows chill. Your fire sputters as a low mist gathers around the edges of your camp, growing closer as the night wears on. By morning, the fog hangs thick in the air, turning the, gray, the trees around you into grey ghosts. And you notice something unsettling. These aren't the same trees that surrounded you the night before. <gasps> the horror. So Ravenloft is a campaign setting, um, started in 1983 with the Ravenloft um, source book, uh, I6, Intermediate 6, and is now uh, represented by Curse of Strahd, which was released in 2016 for the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Both of them created and written by Tracy and Laura Hickman. As I mentioned before, it's based hev heavily on Gothic text, the vast spread of all potential Gothic spreads. And it has, um, in some ways, unique to a lot of adventures, a core antagonist, Count Strahd von Zarovich, the vampire lord of Barovia. Strahd is this kind of baronic, tragic figure, um, and he in himself is, uh, has been made quite complicated and quite deep for various other um, elements of the canon. Um, there's some novels, that there's various other Ravenloft uh, adjacent settings. But one thing that's interesting Interesting is that the entirety of Barovia is not a place that exists. It's not a geographical location. It is its own dimension that is formed out of his own grief and sorrow. Oh, so sad. Um, and the horror comes from this element that he's trapped in his own prison and he has brought other people in to be trapped. He's very much an abuser. He's very much an unpleasant kind of character who will play with you. Um, for his own amusement, and even then he's not that amused because he's very old and he's a vampire and he's bored and he's emo. But Barovia itself um, has this gothic aesthetic. To get there, you travel through a series of fog-laden woods. So Barovia is beyond the woods. It's literally Transylvanian. But that's gothic enough, but has it changed D&D mechanically? To talk about that, we need to talk about what the mechanics of D&D are. And we have role play, we have exploration, and we have combat. Role play is how the players interact with the world. Exploration is how they explore the world and find parts of it out. And I've put combat as dominating the world because I think D&D and many games in many ways are a colonial uh, experiment. You start off with nothing in a disordered world. You approach that world aggressively in order to gather resources, whether that's money, power, equipment, whatever. And you make it better for yourself at the expense of other people. So in what I've called vanilla D&D, roleplay I think is still probably the most inherently gothic element of the game. Roleplay asks you to think, how could you be if you weren't how you are? If you had different abilities and different ways of working in the world. It allows you to create your own double to various extents. You could create a character that is exactly you. You could change everything about you to make a different character. It's how you want to be. And it's interested in personas and appearances, how you present yourself to the world, more necessarily than how you are. At least it does that for the players. The dungeon master often, kind of traditionally, as I mentioned before, plays the world, but that is relegated to playing enemies who inevitably get killed, um, line up for the players to beat them on the head, and you play a series of relatively generic NPCs like the innkeeper, the merchant, and various other ones. And you often have a single end of game boss who waits patiently at the end of the final dungeon to be killed by the players. This picture here is Wave Echo Cave, which is the final um, dungeon of the Lost Mine of Thandelver um, adventure. Apologies for any spoilers, there's no markers on there, so hopefully it doesn't uh, cause too many problems. But the final end of game boss sits in that room at the end uh, throughout the entire adventure. They've been painted as this kind of um, overarching enemy, but they've done nothing. They've not really threatened the players in any way, um, apart from in the final battle. So you sit there waiting for them to arrive, as often happens in kind of bad fantasy stuff. Bro role, um, Ravenloft uh, and the environment of Barovia breaks these rules by allowing the dungeon master to actually play their own active and involved character. And that's Strahd von Zorovich himself. He's hugely powerful. He's an ancient, many centuries, even more um, old vampire, who is a, war a warrior and a wizard. He controls um, Barovia. He controls its politics, he controls the people, because the country is made from himself. He is inherently um, a part of the world. 
he has all of the inherent powers of a vampire, but he has few of the limitations, again, because it's his world. Barovia is covered eternally in um, storm clouds and fog, so he doesn't have to fear the sun. Water ceases to flow when he comes by, so he can cross running water. Um, and most importantly, Strahd can be encountered far before the PCs are able to deal with him, if they are, indeed ever are, because certain actions have to be undertaken before he can be even harmed, let alone killed. And that removes player agency. And player agency is perhaps the key element of Dungeons and Dragons. Players should be able to do pretty much what they want to do. In Ravenloft and in the country Barovia, they can't. Exploration as well in vanilla um, Dungeons and Dragons, you have this idea of a dichotomy between the dungeon and the town. Dungeons are dangerous, towns are safe. I put safe er because often um, you can obviously have problems in towns, but they are a place of respite. The dungeon is where you kill baddies, you steal their stuff, and you do it again and again until you've got enough stuff. A town is where you buy new things and upgrade the existing things that you have. And you do that again and again until you run out of money. You go back to the dungeon, then you go back to the town, dungeon town, dungeon town. And in a very boring, basic way, that's what Dungeons and Dragons is. But critically, players can choose how they come and go. Even if they have to flee, they are able to go. You can get past halfway through a dungeon, think that you are exhausted, maybe wounded, maybe you're just carrying enough stuff. You leave, you go back to the um, town, rest in an inn, and you can have some respite. In Ravenloft, there is no respite. The environment itself is a threat to the players. We have a lot of use of um, Ruskin's pathetic fallacy, which is where inanimate objects, the environment, the weather, rocks, um, water, is given its own emotional response to the world, an intent. And the initial sentence of uh, Curse of Strahd on the back of the book um, opens with under raging storm clouds. The weather itself is enraged by the presence of these player characters coming into the game. Towns in Barovia have very few supplies. Um, the stuff they have is kind of outdated, a lot of it is broken. Food tends to be fairly tasteless and rotten. Um, they are unwelcoming. Um, the people of uh, certain towns in Barovia are actively xenophobic against people coming in because of the fear that they've been put under for so many years. And the towns themselves, rather than being restful, are full of traps and dangers. The town sometimes can be more dangerous than the countryside in Ravenloft. And crucially, the PCs can't leave. Once you're in Barovia, you cannot leave unless Strahd lets you leave, and Strahd will never let you leave. There is no dungeon the difference, there is a homogeneity between the dungeon and the town. The whole place is a dungeon. And again, that takes away from player agency. They can't flee, they can't give up and leave. And combat, the final pillar um, in vanilla D&D, I think it's often not necessarily the most boring, but certainly one of the least interesting parts of the game for me. Enemies are obvious. They live in places where you expect enemies to live. They live in dungeons, they live in dark forests, they live in the depths of the sea. They live in places where you have to go to in order to fight them. And they want to fight you, they're obnoxious. Enemies attack on sight. Even the ones that don't necessarily attack you straight off, like a goblin might do, if you have an ancient evil wizard um, or someone like that, they are not attacking you in order to get you into a position where they can attack you more readily. And they are, very crucially, othered. Enemies in D&D look and act differently to the player characters. And the implication very strongly is that they look and act worse than the player characters. Even if player characters perform evil acts, they do it for a reason. Enemies in, um, in Dungeons and Dragons are often portrayed as unreasoning in some way, and hopefully if we have time, we'll talk about that a bit more later on. But in Ravenloft, we don't have many of these monsters. There are some, but most of the monsters that we um, encounter are ourselves depicted as monsters. We have vampires, we have revenants, and we have ghosts. And I think that they are the three main Gothic creatures that we experience in classic Gothic literature, certainly. And I've put there um, the illustration by Edward Gorey of Lucy um, from Dracula. And I think she's a good um, example, for me, a more frightening and upsetting example of monstrosity and how we become monstrous, far more than Dracula himself. As it says in the book, 
She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained, voluptuous mouth, which it made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. And that, to me, Lucy, who is a character who everyone loves, she is kind to animals, she's kind to old people, she's helpful and she's full of joy and life. And how she is then turned into a monster, literally turned into a vampire. And then she's described by a child as the bluefer lady who preys on children, one of the things that she, as a human being, felt love for. It's this switch around. And that happens a lot in uh, Ravenloft. The creatures that we see and we are forced to fight are like mirror images of ourselves in a kind of carnival mirror, distorted and dangerous. But they are what we could become. And sometimes what player characters themselves become when they are become um, fueled with power and go on killing sprees, which some player characters do do. And I think this way of looking at combat in Ravenloft allows us to sort of critique a number of things, perhaps the main ones being colonialism, nationalism and patriarchy. When we are presented with these enemies, we have to think to ourselves, who are we fighting against? Are we fighting against someone who thinks the same about us? Are they fighting back because we are stealing their stuff? Are we fighting back because they're trying to oust us from where we live? And what is it that you're fighting for? What is it that you actually want to achieve? Are you simply fighting because that's what you're expected to do? And there's two characters, I think, um, kind of uh, good exemplars of this in Ravenloft, in some of the expanded Ravenloft stuff. First of all, we have Davian Martikov. He's the um, patriarch of the Martikov family who lives in Barovia and has lived there for as long as anybody has, which is many, many hundreds of years. And he presents initially as an old man, quite decrepit, um, but he is, um, unbeknownst to many people, a weir raven. And if there's a more gothic creature than a weir raven, I'd like you to try and put it in the chat. That'd be interesting to know. But he is a monster. He is a human being who transforms into a bird um, and has all of the weir creature's abilities. You can see in the uh, picture of him there, he's kind of stooped. He has a bird-like appearance. The cloak droops down like wings. So even that animalness, uh, animality has gone into his humanity. But he's a good guy. He opposes Strahd's tyranny, not necessarily openly because that's too dangerous, but he certainly works to help anybody who he feels might be able to um, fight against Strahd and remove him and end this horror that he's been placed into. And he's opposed by Rahadin. Now, Rahadin is an elf. Um, he's a dusk elf, which is a, a certain kind of a sub race of elves, but elves are normally good guys. You do have some evil ones, but not very often. Um, they lo no, tend to have the long picture. Elves live for hundreds of years, so they have this pragmatic view of the world. They tend to approach things relatively gently, and if not, slowly. But Rahadin is one of the most evil creatures in Ravenloft, possibly more evil even than Strahd himself. Rahadin is a traitor. His actions and his intent, um, uh, intentional actions have led to the destruction of his entire race. He's a murderer and an assassin, and he has led to the deaths of many thousands of people. And anyone who um, comes close to uh, Rahadin slowly starts to hear the screams and the final pleading cries of every single one of his victims. The implication is that Rahadin can also hear that all the time, but he doesn't care. He has no interests, no empathy, and no emotional link to his actions. So we have this archetypal um, upstanding figure who has been um, turned irrevocably evil. So we've got then these three um, pillars. Um, and I think, hopefully, I've tried to explain how using Gothic elements and looking at um, d and through this kind of gothic lens, questions these pillars. If we interact with the world, how do we interact with the world? How is it that we um, approach other people? And how is it that we expect them to approach us? When we explore the world, how do we do that? Do we just barge in, kick down the dungeon door and roar in? Um, do we just roam through um, a wood, which may be many creatures' um, habitat? And when we fight, why are we fighting? Why should we expect to dominate the world? Why should we even have the intent, intent of doing that? Are there, um, is it when we go into some settlement in order to kill all of the uh, monsters, we are as evil as uh, we believe them to be? 
So what I want to move on to now, I've got a little bit of time. There's a few extra slides about some of the present issues of Dungeons and Dragons and hopefully some of the future elements um, of D&D and what we can do about them. The first one I want to talk about is sexuality and how that's presented in D&D. And interestingly, um, as far back certainly as I can remember, D&D has always been gender agnostic. It doesn't matter which sex or gender uh, you choose to be in the game. You have the same abilities and you have the same opportunities as are defined by your class and your race. And even in certain settings, you have constructs and you have mechanical beings who have no concept of gender. Um, it doesn't apply to them and they have no means of it. And it's quite interesting to be able to do that, to play through a character who's different than you are, or who to play through a character who is what you want to be and be able to practice um, this being um, and hopefully become more yourself, which I think is a very powerful thing that Dungeons and Dragons can do. And even in Dungeons and Dragons explicitly, there have been um, examples of a sexuality that is maybe different from what some people might expect to see. In the Siege of Dragonspear, which is a video game for Dungeons and Dragons from 2016, one of the main characters in that is Magina, and she's a cleric of Tempus. She's a warrior and a magic user, very powerful, and she persists through the entire game as one of the main characters. And she is a trans woman, and she explains that um, quite plainly, but only if you speak to her and ask her about it. However, there was a huge outcry when this game was released um, of many people complaining about um, the, the SJW uh, social justice warrior elements of Dungeons and Dragons, how it ruined the games um, and various things like that. A lot of people got very annoyed, the same kind of people you would imagine get annoyed about this kind of representation. And that still lingers. We also have Dragon of Ice Spear, Ice Spire Peak, um, which is the kind of brother um, uh, adventure to Lost Mine of Fandelver. It's included in the Essentials Kit, which is the second introductory kit that was released for 5th edition. And that includes two characters called Nurkli and Corboge, and they are the co-kings of Nomengard, one of the main gnomish settlements in the area. And they, explicitly in the book, are a gay couple. And the book um, explains the emotional and romantic link between the two, and that is a major part of one of the scenarios um, of the game. Their love for each other is being threatened. Um, and the players have to help them rebuild that. That's two examples though, recent examples from 45 years or so of Dungeons and Dragons. There are more and players obviously can develop as many as they want. You can homebrew elements and players can become whoever they want. But there is still lots to do when we talk about representation of sexuality um, in the game. And there is, unfortunately, lots of resistance from players, even if not from the mechanics of the game and the ability to do this. There is huge amounts of uh, problematic players and lots of toxicity in Dungeons and Dragons. And I think it's un unfair to say that there isn't. However, there are lots of um, uh, areas in the, web, in the web where you can talk about this and discuss this. And I think um, it's, it, hopefully it's getting better. Um, even if there is still lots of things to do. Where Dungeons and Dragons does have a massive problem though is race and the present presentation of race and race analogues. And there is a big discussion within Dungeons and Dragons um, communities at the moment about a thing called the orc discourse. And orcs are presented um, as bestial, as inherently violent, willfully ignorant, they have no um, interest in learning, um, or changing themselves. They are crucially differently coloured um, than many of the other um, races. A lot of the orc related races like goblins and trolls are, are the same, um, differently coloured. And they are described even now, uh, if you go onto the D&D Beyond uh, website which presents a number of the rules, they are described as a tribal plague that procreate often and indiscriminately with the aim to take over the world exactly like a plague would do. And that if we are trying to um, involve more people and involve um, more varied people and diverse people is not a good thing to have. We need to be able to work through this and figure out how we can uh, make this better. If somebody comes to play the game, and I hope they do, and they themselves are differently coloured and they um, see this representation, that's not acceptable anymore, I don't think, um, and I hope we can change that. It comes ultimately to the problem of evil. The problem of evil in a Dungeons and Dragons um, situation, not necessarily the actual formal philosophical um, description of it. Do you do bad things because you're evil? 
Are you set, told you're the evil character, you're the good character, the evil character does bad things, the good character does good things? Or is it rather like Rahadin, who started out as not necessarily good, but certainly not necessarily evil, and are you evil because you do bad things? And that's something that I think is, um, is too much for me to get into. I don't have much longer, but there is a book called Dungeons and Dragons and Philosophy. It's part of um, the popular, uh, popular culture and philosophy uh, series from Blackwell that has a lot of good um, essays in it uh, and is worth looking at if that's something that you're interested in. So this is now my final slide. Um, D and D and G, Dungeons and Dragons and the Gothic. And I hope at least um, this has been enjoyable, but I hope also that you've looked at um, how the Gothic can change how we think about things that are built from rules. Dungeons and Dragons, as I've said, is built from rules, lots of rules, and they are interpreted by an authority who's not necessarily in charge, but does have that role where they interpret those rules. But if you look at that in a Gothic approach, that allows us to question those rules. Are those rules correct? Are they useful? Are they fun? We can challenge the authority. Maybe the decisions aren't the ones that we expect to be made. Maybe they aren't the ones that are the best for the game, for the world. And it allows us to play more fully. I think play more authentically might be a good way to put it. We are able to play without restrictions in a kind of sandbox that allows us to do that. And once we do that in a game, we can think about doing that in the real world. And we can look at rules and authority and we can see what might make things more fun for us and for other people, to make it more fun for the most people. Um, and that is the end. Thank you very much. Um, I, like I say, I hope you've enjoyed that. I'd be really keen if people have questions um, or any comments, even criticisms. Um, I'm quite um, aware that this is my approach to Dungeons and Dragons and some of the elements. So um, if you think I've been talking nonsense, that's as good as, um, as a question that you might have. So please, um, I do hope you can um, involve. So I'm going to stop my screen uh, sharing and I think we can open it up. Oh, you're on, yeah, you're yep, on mute. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, I was looking at my um, lounge clock, which is a bit slow. So I'm sorry we've gone over slightly. No, no worries. Um, if people do have to go, um, then we completely understand. Um, if you would like to stay and ask some questions or chat about the talk today, then do please stay. Um, Dan, have you got your links to pop in the uh, chat? Yes, I will do. Um, so first of all, my web's been playing up, so I will just grab these. I didn't put them, didn't load them up first of all. Uh, if anyone's been inspired to play Dungeons and Dragons, and um, with the caveat that there are other role-playing games available, um, you can download the core rules for free from the Wizards of the Coast website. Um, so that's the company who make D&D at the moment, and you can get that as a PDF and online from that link there. Um, if you want to get in touch and chat about any of this, my um, email address is there. That's also my uh, PayPal address. So if you want to make a donation or a contribution to this, um, that would be really good. But as Sam said, I'm doing this because I, I love games and I'd like to talk to people about it. So um, if you do want to um, spend some money, buy yourself a game, um, buy yourself something that you can play with. That'd be really cool. Uh, and if you want to um, follow me on the Twitters, that is my handle there. And one final thing, I will add my, there we go. This is the link to my blog um, where I've put other presentations for conferences that I've done, some of the stories and fiction that I write, some of the non-fiction criticism that I do. And one of the main things I'm doing at the moment is um, doing readings of some of my favorite short weird fiction. They're on there as well. Um, normally there would be a new one today, but I've been doing this instead. Um, but we've got a few, I think there's about a dozen, maybe slightly more um, stories for you to read from five minutes to about half an hour. So they're quite short ones. Yeah, I recommend particularly the uh, Robert Murray Gilchrist. Um. Oh, yes. Good old Mr. Gilchrist. Yeah, Robert Murray Gilchrist is a very, kind of a, well, he's slightly a niche author. He was the other option for this, but D&D won out. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, pop them in the chat or ask by a video if you want at the moment, I'm still recording.
but feel free. I'm just having a look through the comments before in case there's anything there. It's been an interesting balance, I think. Like this morning, far fewer people were D&D players and this evening it feels like there's a lot more D&D players in the house. <laughs> yeah, there was a few. I noticed, I can't remember who it was, but she had the, um, the Curse of Strahd book out while I was talking. So there were a few. Um, but yeah, it's nice not, not to have people, people who may have played games. Or, it's weird, the crossover between board gaming and role playing now. There's a lot of people who thought maybe role playing was too complicated. Or even, it's quite intimidating thinking you have to act all the time. Uh, you have to play a character. That's not necessarily the case. Um, you can just be yourself. Um, it's, it's, it is what it, you want it to be, which I think is the best thing about it. So you've got a question at the bottom, Dan. Oh, let's go down. Is there a game you'd suggest for beginners? D&D, um, &D, <laughs> to be honest. If you get the starter set, which is a box set, um, that gives you a very slimmed down version of the rules. Um, so you don't have to uh, learn everything. It's, that's quite daunting going to that start off with. Um, it gives that adventure, The Lost Mine of Fandelva, which is a, a small um, self-contained adventure. That's really good in explaining that role play, exploration, combat pillar system without really explaining that's what it's doing and being too, um, uh, too obvious about it. So it's a good way of a dungeon master coming to it. It's a good way of players coming to it. It also kind of crucially has six um, pre-made characters. So you can roll up um, and play the game. You can give people characters and they can go with that. Um, it has dice. Uh, it has everything that you need apart from a pencil, basically. Um, it doesn't have any of the models, but you don't really need those. You don't need those at all. They're just embellishments. Um, if you're less interested in fantasy games, there's a game called uh, Mothership, uh, which is a fairly independent game. That's um, quite a nice one. That's very rules light. Um, rolling dice is more unusual um, than it would be in D&D. &D. Um, you kind of just play the game. And if it's a thing that can happen, you don't have to do a skill check or anything. It just happens. Um, and yeah, you've got things, there's a couple of mentions in the, the comments. Pathfinder is a kind of offshoot of D&D, &D, um, which is a different way of doing it. For a starter, I wouldn't go into Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Um, that's death by tables for a lot of people. Um, and I think for me, it's more nostalgia than, than anything else that, um, that comes to the game. But um, I'm sure there's, there's more. But yeah, I would say if you want to have a go at it, the, the starter set is cheap um, and it gives you everything that you need to do. Um, and if you find you don't like D&D, &D, it gives you at least an idea of roleplaying. Oh yeah, there's Rosemary's put about um, uh, Dungeon World. Is another good one. There's a few. There's um, a thing called OSR, so it's basically old school rules. Um, there's a lot of stuff online where people have just made their own um, games. There's one called Troika, um, which a friend of mine is going to be playing soon. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, that's a very irreverent um, game. So if you want a bit more humour or at least a bit more absurdity, um, something like Troika might be quite good. Um, have I ever played Mask of the Red Death? Uh, I have played a bit. Um, we had a kind of Ravenloft period, probably about 10 years ago now or so. I don't know when it was. It felt like a long time ago. Um, so yeah, Ravenloft is not just Curse of Strahd. Ravenloft exploded into its own kind of um, line, um, exploring a lot of the other Gothic tropes that you can have. So there is one that is um, Mask of the Red Death. Uh, there's one that's much more like Frankenstein. Um, they all have the same grimness to certain degrees. Um, so yeah, if you want to explore that more, there's certainly that. And uh, as Ben just said, Magic, um, Vampire the Masquerade has other um, settings as well. Mage the Awakening, there's, oh, I can't remember, there's a few other. That's one I haven't, I haven't delved into to, to a great degree, apart from the, the other one. Oh, I have a question, uh, just a quick one. I was just wondering, um, oh, thank you. I re really enjoyed it. And I'm going to look out for Ravenloft because I haven't played that. Cool. <laughs> cool. That's really good. Um, um, so yeah, I was just wondering what the difference was between a Dusk Elf and a, a Dark Elf or a Drow. Dusk Elves are, they're more um, surface elves. Um, so they are um, what you would think of as the core elf race. They're kind of, I think they go back a bit in um, Dungeons and Dragons 
law, but they were kind of built up um, more for Curse of Strahd, just so Rahadin could have a race that had disappeared. Um, Drow, um, just to explain for other people, Dark Elves are a race of elves who turned away from their, um, their race and went into the Underdark, which is a series of very deep caves that um, penetrate underneath the, the surface world. And they're kind of, um, they are, yeah, they are different. I mean, they, they're kind of, it's the tragedy of the drow and the normal elves is that they are really the same. There's always that kind of undercurrent that the drow were tricked by Lolth, who's their goddess, the spider queen. Um, and again, that's the thing. I could have gone into the idea of the drow um, as a racial aspect. They have black skin as opposed that's to the pale I was thinking skin. When you think about the orcs. Yeah. Color skin. And that's another thing. Um, Drow are black skinned. They are inherently and often irredeemably evil, depraved creatures. Um, They are more likely to be shown um, as foils to the rare good drow that you get and more um, often to surface creatures. So that is kind of very problematic in a lot of lot of ways um, from racial aspects, but also the idea that somebody is told they're evil from their birth and that makes them become evil. Um, so yeah, to answer, I've hopefully answered the question. They are both elves, both types of elves. Um, and I don't think there are any other Dusk Elves apart from Rahadin. I may be wrong on that. Oh, okay. So it's specifically but, for that setting. Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. they, um, That's probably why I haven't heard of them then. Yeah, well, I think the idea is that they, they were in what became Barovia before Strahd kind of took it over and twisted it. Um, and that's why they're called Dusk Elves, because the, the gloom um, has made them kind of gloomy. Um, but yeah, they, I'm sure, I haven't read all of the books and the novels. I'm so sure they're more sort of grey elves rather than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. They're, they're very much um, pers- uh, presented not as inherently evil as the drow are. Rahadin is kind of that, this aberration that sprung from them. In a flip of Drizzt, I suppose, Drizzt being a good drow, um, he's shown as unusual and to... It's a normal drow, an aberration. Um, Rahadin is, is, is deeply unpleasant. Interestingly, though, um, whenever the players, if the players kill Strahd, Rahadin um, descends into a, a rage-filled grief and pursues the characters um, as far as he can. And it's kind of portrayed, not explicitly, but other, um, uh, other stories have shown it, that Rahadin is actually Strahd's lover. Um, and that is why he, he descends into this... Um, uh, this horror and that's interesting because it kind of even though he's so evil so murderous he still can feel at least some affection for somebody else um it doesn't get played on as much as i think it should do that because i think that makes it a bit more interesting but equally sometimes it is good to have someone who's absolutely awful <laughs> oh cool no i often play i pl- dr- play drow because obviously that's an option so yeah it's, yeah. These, uh... it's an interesting one it is different i mean you've got like um drizzed You've got Viconia in the Baldur's Gate games. She's a very interesting character. She's a drow. And you can use that to talk about persecution because as much as the drow are presented as inherently evil, they're assumed to be inherently evil by other people. So they kind of react against that. If I'm, if I'm being told I'm evil, I might as well be evil. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And it's quite do. interesting to play as a character because you, you've obviously got to be part of a party. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, you've got to be part you know, of with a GM, I, I, you know, out of character talking to the GM saying there needs to be a reason why this, my character wants to be with these people because yeah. Yeah. I'm not a kind of saving the world kind of person here. Yeah, here. and my, the character I play is a tiefling, normally because uh-huh. my main group are, you know, fairly normal dwarf, elf, two humans, halfling kind of characters. Um, so when I play, and if somebody takes over, sometimes we do that for a while and have a little offshoot. Um, it's interesting to have a... Um, Fairly unpleasant tiefling, join the group for a little while. There's a question there from Trey, is it evil or are different cultural norms? Exactly, yes. Um, it's interesting, I think, when the, um, when the orcs are involved, they are shown from a kind of a human perspective as these ravening beasts that descend from the north and take over everything. Um, but the orcs themselves, you could say, see cult- civilization is encroaching on their um, uh, their land and their way of life. Um, it's interesting that you have something like, say, Elder Scrolls, where the orcs are just shown as another sentient race. Um, they're not shown as something that is um, inherently evil. I think D&D is a bit backwards there. Um, they aren't just a monster. They're not like, you know, I don't know, a giant spider who just, you know, eats and 
recreates. They are shown as sentient, sentient creatures, but they're shown as lesser. Um, and that, yeah, I, I don't think I'm probably the best person to talk about that. I did want to mention it. Um, I think there's a lot more, uh, there's lots of stuff on the, on the web. If you read, search for the orc discourse, um, there's lots of good criticism and lots of challenging criticism for me as a kind of, obviously as a white middle-class British person who's playing Dungeons and Dragons, which is itself quite white. Um, so it's good. And yeah, Ben to the stuff in, in Skyrim. Yeah, you can uh, be part of Orcs. Um, their, their culture in Skyrim and Elder Scrolls is very interesting um, and more developed than it is in D&D, I think. Mm. Interestingly, you can have half Orcs who are, um, they're seen as a, the ability to be player characters. So they're somehow seen as um, more, certainly more sentient, um, more moral, which is a bit weird. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, it's like a lot of things, it's how it's always been done. Orcs have always been shown as monsters, drow have always been shown as evil. And no one's ever challenged that, so not so certain the degree that it has been now. Um, and I think it is good that it is being challenged. Uh, I think it has to be. Does anyone else have any questions or thoughts? Um, what I'll do at the moment is just turn off the recording. Um, I'll still be here, but just so that we can feel a bit more comfortable. But thank you very much, Dan. Um, and I will turn off the recording. <laughs>